Welcome to Dr. B Music Theory. I have a Patreon page and had a question from one of my supporters there. The question was, I understand Fuxi and Counterpoint, but I don't see the practical use of it. In the copies of Mozart's lessons to Thomas Atwood, he's teaching it. But if I listen to, for example, Mozart's Symphony 39 in E flat, where is the practical use of Fuxi and Counterpoint there, especially read the basic rules taught? There was a follow-up comment that said, is there any chance of using some Mozart for this purpose, or at least an example or two of Mozart, maybe a string quartet, or quintet maybe? So this question is referring to a book by Johann Josef Fuchs called Gratis ad Parnassum. Essentially in the Baroque era, uh, early 1700s, this book uh, talked extensively about counterpoint. It was a, a, almost like a, a textbook on counterpoint. Uh, I'm going to put a link to that book in the YouTube video underneath here. So you can actually get a copy, download a free copy of this book to see for yourself what it's about. Now there's some challenges when you look at this book. For example, it uses a lot of movable C-clef, which is something that most of us today are not that comfortable with. Uh, it also has some uh, somewhat older English style writing and, and letters and stuff. But for the most part, you can understand that part. But to understand Fuxi and Counterpoint is no small feat. It's a pretty big book with a lot of very, very advanced concepts. So I am a, a skeptic by nature. When someone says, I understand Fuxi and Counterpoint, I always have to ask myself, do you really? Maybe, maybe you do, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a daunting undertaking to really understand this type of counterpoint. And it's important to differentiate that that style of counterpoint is somewhat different. I mean, there's overlap, but it's somewhat different from the type of music theory and the basic rules that are taught in most textbooks today. So the reason I like this question so much is the, the person asking doesn't see the practical use of the theory being studied. And although some of you, some of you viewing this may be just watching this video so that you can pass a entrance exam into graduate school theory or place out of a theory, uh, theory course for your graduate work or undergraduate, or you're just taking AP music theory and you, you just got to make sure you pass the test, you want to get good grades, that's, that's perfectly valid, but to understand how it can be practically used for those of you out there who want to be better composers or better arrangers, understanding why the music theory that's being discussed has some practical value in both Fuxi and Counterpoint and the, the type of harmony taught in most music theory books today is of practical use. You just have to understand in what context it's going to be most useful. So uh, before we really get into this, I think we have to understand Fuchs wrote this book, Gratis Ad Parnassum. It was very influential on a number of very well-known composers. So people like Haydn studied it, Mozart, Beethoven, and some music institutions still use it today to teach counterpoint. So this is a very influential book. So let's take a look, right? So the first thing Fuchs does is he talks about first counterpoints. This is sometimes called first species counterpoint. And the whole point of this is note against note, which looks a little bit like these three measures I have right here, where you have a note against another note. One, one note to one note, one note to one note, one note to one note. So it's often written in whole notes, so you can see how they relate to each other. And what Fuchs does is he starts to talk about how to use consonants. And he differentiates between what count as consonances and what count as dissonances. This is not something that's, you know, you can't just take this as a given. Uh, during the Middle Ages, there were, there were slightly different concepts of consonants and dissonance than there was during the Renaissance, for example. Fuchs then talks about the motion, how the different voices can move. They can move parallel to each other, 
They can move a contrary motion to each other, oblique motion, all right? And if this is something that, that you haven't, you, you don't really quite understand, that's okay for now. But if you do want to know, I do have a, uh, um, two lessons that I did where I talked extensively about first species counterpoint. I'll put a link to those as well in the notes below. So if you want to delve in deep into first species counterpoint, I have some lessons for you. But essentially, if, we, if I play this for you, it might sound something like And in this case, we have contrary motion, right? So the, the top voice is moving down, while the bottom voice is moving up. So all the voices are contrary. And then you often, when you're analyzing this, you analyze the interval. So this would be C to C, would be an octave. So you would write an eight right in the middle of the, in between the two staves. E to B would be a fifth. F to A would be a third. These are all consonants, perfect consonants, perfect consonants, imperfect consonants. And Fuchs talks about perfect versus imperfect consonances. He talks about melodic movement as well. So how, how melodies should go up and down and how they shouldn't have too many of the same note high. So there's a kind of a natural ebb and flow and contour to these melodies. These are the types of things Fuchs talks about for first species. But that's just scratching the surface. He then goes on to second species, where you have two notes moving against one note. So we're talking about the rhythm of this. And what he introduces there is how you can use the dissonances. So first species only uses consonants. But second species, which these next three measures can demonstrate, would sound something like this. We can do the same intervallic analysis, which is very common when you're studying this kind of Fuchsian counterpoint. So you would say D to A is a fifth, D to D is an octave, F to A is a third, F to B is an augmented fourth, so that's definitely a dissonance, then E to C is a sixth, and E to G is a third. So right here is our only dissonance. Uh, in this example. And you can see that Fuchs has rules on how you would do this. In this case, this B is treated very much like a passing tone. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, go and study the non-chord tone lessons that I have up online. But a passing tone means that you, you move by step into the note and you continue by step in the same direction. And so that passing tone is how the human ear can hear that dissonance without it sounding random or bizarre. Your ear can feel the dissonance, it creates a certain emotion, but then it resolves in a way that your brain and your ear can make sense of. So that's second species. Then you get to third species where you have four notes against one note. So you can just imagine I'll have whole notes here and have quarter notes moving on top of that. When you get to fourth counterpoint or fourth species, you start dealing with syncopation, where, where notes are being tied over uh, bar lines or, or in the middle of a bar in ways that are, are syncopated. And then finally, you get to what Fuchs calls florid counterpoint or fifth counterpoint, where it's a mixture of all of the above. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a photo on, on you know, I'm going to show you this photo here of what a page from Fuchs's counterpoint would actually look like. Um, so this would be an example of fifth or florid counterpoint. And if we look at this example here, you can see that we have whole notes in all the bottom three parts. And then we have a combination of half notes, whole notes, quarter notes, uh, and, and various note values. So we can see what that might look like. All this is going to be important, so stick with me, because the question is how does this Fuchsian counterpoint relate to the music of Mozart? How is it of practical use? So we're going to get there. So 
after Fuchs goes through how two voices can interact in a contrapuntal nature. He goes on and he talks about how to do that with three different parts, so three different melodies. And then finally four parts. And then he talks about imitation, how one part could have similar melodic shape and intervals and rhythms as one of the other parts. And then he takes it even further and he goes into the fugue, which is a very specific type uh, and form for using imitation. Something that was very common in the Baroque era, which is what preceded that time period that Mozart is no, most known for, the classical era, or, or essentially the 18th century. So he, Fuchs then goes on and talks about fugues in two parts, three parts, and four parts. And I'm going to show you a picture here of what Fuchs would write here. Uh, and this was a four-part fugue, and this is from Gratis Ad Parnassum. And remember where this is on the timing of the video, because you might want to go back and compare this to the Mozart example I'm going to show you a little bit later. But you can see that we have the variety of note values, and the entire Gratis Ad Parnassum talks about and lays out the rules on how you would come up with this four-part fugue example that you are looking at. So how does that, where does that lead us, right? So Mozart writes his symphony number 39 in 1788. Now this symphony is primarily in the newer classic style, in the 18th century style. It is not as similar to the Baroque era and the Renaissance and the style that Fuchs is talking about. So the style of the, the, the Symphony No. 39 is primarily homophonic, okay? And it doesn't really use a lot of counterpoint. So when the question is asked, I don't see how Fuchsian counterpoint relates to Symphony 39, well, there's some validity to that observation. It's, it's not super similar. There are some tie-overs. There is some practical use of Fuchsian, even within Symphony 39, but it's not obvious. This was written in 1788. In the same year, Mozart uh, writes his Symphony 41, the Jupiter Symphony, and, and, the, and specifically the finale. So what's similar between Symphony 39 in Symphony 41 in terms of what Mozart got from Fuchsian counterpoint. Well, this understanding of the consonances and the dissonances, how they relate, how they work, this idea of melodic, of, of the different types of motions and how things, uh, contrary motion, how valuable and how effective that is, that's something that's found in, in both the symphonies and the practical use, and this idea of melodic movement and how the melodies can move. Uh, into dissonances and out of dissonances. So that can be found in both Symphony 39 and 41. But if we go to the finale, the last movement of the Jupiter Symphony, and especially start listening at about 31 seconds in, uh, there's a little bit of introduction. I'm going to put a link to this, uh, to, a, uh, to a video of this that has the sheet music along with it. So you can pause this video right now and go listen or Go listen to it now. Great. So unpause if you've just listened to it. Starting, so that 31 seconds, you can hear that it has this imitation and fugue-like texture. Mozart uses almost exactly what Fuchs is talking about. So when you say, I don't see the practical use, well, look at what Fuchs wrote in terms of the, the four-part fugue, and look at the sheet music for Mozart, and tell me you don't see a similarity. So let's look really right now and analyze this. Measures 36 to 38, okay? Um, we can see that it starts in the violin two, and we have, and I'm gonna play a little bit of this on piano so we can hear it, all right? So we have the melody start all by itself. A singular melody, C, D, F, and those three whole notes kind of form the beginning of what's sometimes called a subject, uh, a, a, a melodic kernel that becomes repeated 
and utilized and creates a certain repetition, continuity, and allows to be varied. So that's how we start. Just the second violins all by themselves. Okay? So if we move on and look at measure 39, we get to see that it moves into two parts. We have the violin one come in and play Well, the violin two continues, right? So you'll notice that it's a very it's 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 very similar to what we just we just heard. The first one was C D F, or if we were to analyze it, up a major second and then up a minor third. We do the exact same thing, the same intervallic structure, starting on a G. This is common in a fugue. In, in terms of how fugues are written, that you'll have it start uh, uh, at what's on, on one note, and then it starts a fifth higher. So, so it, this is super, super common uh, in music. And we can see that that's repeated. And that second, that second, uh, second violin kind of continues to, to, uh, to, exp to with something that almost becomes uh, a second subject, or what's sometimes called a counter subject. But let's continue and look forward here where we go into three parts where you can see in the viola we get we go back down to the exact same three notes that we started with and then three measures later in the cello we have the beginning of that same theme once again Notice that we have this imitation, exactly what Fuchs is talking about. And 